I want to take you back to a time when Pluto was a planet. I'm six years old in primary school, and my teacher writes on the board the list of planets in order of their distance from the sun. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Only I know she's wrong. I know this because everyone else has a crush on Jason Donovan, and I have one on Patrick Moore. <laughs> my brother had his book as a Christmas present, and I've read it. And in it, Moore says that the order of Neptune and Pluto changes. Right now, it's Pluto-Neptune. So I stick up my hands and I tell my teacher, because I'm six, and I have no idea about social boundaries, or the fact that being corrected by a child is going to really annoy her. <laughs> and she says, oh, but your brother's good at science. I thought you'd be good at arty things. Now, <laughs> Let's leave aside the gender stereotypical assumption I think she made there, hard though that is, though as an aside, if you have a daughter, please take her to science museums. But this is the moment when I first realized the divide between the arts and science, that they must be kept separate somehow for some mythical reason, and how our education system enforces that and pushes you down one path or another. And I grew up resenting that. Fast forward, her prediction proves true. My brother continues to be good at science. He did a maths degree, I did an English one. But a few years after graduating, I pick up a book, John Carey's What Good Are the Arts, and I read his argument that poetry and algebra are in fact pretty similar. They're both after a ball down truth. And I start thinking about my early love of the sciences and scientific discovery, and I write a play about the first human vivisections. And a few years later, I realized that science and medical themes are increasingly creeping into my work. And I start to question why. I conclude something quite stark. I passionately believe in theater. I believe in its power to influence and change thought, and that changing thought can change lives and society. I believe in society. I also believe that if theater is to continue to be relevant in the 21st century, then it has to engage with scientific thoughts and any ethical considerations arising from that. Why? Well, to explain, we need to look at what theatre's for and how it came to be. When humans first discovered fire, this is a potted history of theatre here, so bear with me, we sat around campfires and we told each other stories, one voice. Then the chorus came along and we had, essentially, two voices, dialogue, and then characters and boom. There it was. We now have film and telly and radio drama, but there is still something very powerful about us all coming together into one space to explore what it means to be human. Because I think that's what theatre does explore. And it can be Hamlet banging on about something or other, or a comedy, but the currency is the same. What it means to be alive and how we navigate that. And that hasn't really changed since we sat around the fire. Except now, now things are changing. For good or ill, we're stepping out of natural evolution because of medical and scientific advancement. Science used to explain the world around us. Now it can shape and influence both it and us as a species in ways that are unprecedented. We can keep someone alive through organ donation and blood transfusion. We can help infertile couples conceive via IVF. We can bioengineer glow-in-the-dark monkeys using DNA collected from jellyfish. And we can grow human organs on the backs of mice. And we can interfere in the human genetic code. We'll soon be able to make designer babies. And in the UK, it's now legal for a baby to be born with three genetic parents. The first British baby like this will probably be born later this year. Now, I'm not saying any of this is right or wrong. What I am saying is that if theatre is to continue asking questions about what it means to be human, we can't ignore these issues. They're too pressing. So, why aren't we seeing a glut of plays with medical and scientific themes at their heart? Why aren't we picking up theatre term cards and moaning, really, a new play about DNA sequencing again? I think this comes back to the education system. The presumption that for artists, science is hard. For scientists, a potential audience for this work, the arts, or at least the process behind them, remains unknown. 
And the end process and result can't be quantified like a set of lab results. So as communities, we rarely talk to each other. And it's the public, actual and potential theatre goers, who miss out. It's exciting to have those conversations, though. During a period of research and development into a play I'm currently working on, we invited a science professor into the rehearsal room. The actor's enthusiasm was off the chart. A real professor. I mean, a living one. And I've seldom smiled so much as when I read an email sent from a scientist to a scientist about a query I'd sent going, actors, theatre people, what's not to love? But I think one of the reasons we don't have those conversations is because it's hard. Algebra and poetry may have the same pure heart, but one's written in words and one in numbers. We speak different languages. A few years ago, I co-produced a fun palace at Wales Millennium Centre for the theatre company, Agent 160. Fun palaces happens around the country each year. The idea is based on the 1960s premise from playwright Joan Littlewood and architect Cedric Price that there should be community hubs where the arts and sciences come together and everyone can participate. We staged a series of monologues in ours, and I wanted to write one about organ donation because the Welsh consent law on that was just about to change. I like theatre to be relevant, and that was about to affect roughly three million people. Now, I'm married to a medic, and I have a real aversion to mansplaining. But after a few days' research on the internet, I walk into the kitchen as he's making tea, and I say, darling, I need you to explain to me how to cut out a human heart. He's worryingly used to this sort of query. And he says, aha, I have just the thing. Logs onto a website I've never seen before with a look of real glee, hits print, and presents me with a step-by-step -step guide for how to do just that. So I go back into the other room, slightly concerned that this is what doctors do before they perform operations. <laughs> and I try to read what's on that piece of paper, and I can't understand a word. Nothing. So I go back into the kitchen, and I say, I need you to explain to me how to cut out a human heart. He looks at me confused, and I realize we're about to begin a process of translating scientific language to theatrical language. I scribble all over that piece of paper. I write down what a heart smells like, what you'd see if you were in the operating theater. I condense parts of the operation a little. I perform a science to theater vector shift. I'm currently working on a play about sperm donation with Illumin Theater. In 2023, the first wave of children conceived by a gamete donation in this country will be able to trace their genetic parents if, and only if, they know they were conceived that way. This could affect thousands of families each year. But what does this law change mean for couples seeking donor gametes now? How will the child view the donor, their genetic siblings, their parents? Should they legally have to be told there's a donor like they are in New Zealand? What does all of this mean for the family unit, how we view it, how we use that unit to construct society? We're hardwired to explore social questions through story. We evolve that way. And as we continue to make scientific discoveries which take charge of our individual survival, and even our evolution as a species, I think we need story more than ever. We need to explore what it means to be human in the 21st century. We need to come back to the fire. Finally, as a playwright, it feels really strange for me to be up here giving you my words myself. So I've asked Natalie Paisy to revisit the piece featuring organ donation she originally performed at the center. Here's an abridged version of A Mother's Heart. It starts with Reese, my son. That's where my heart story starts. We're in a bus shelter, one just outside from here. I am attacking his face with wet wipes when I feel it. My heart banging inside my chest like a warning. I try to ignore it, but it won't stop. The bus arrives early, but the driver says we can get on. I tell myself it'll stop soon, and I pay. I park Reese in the push chair space. I breathe out, in again. Five minutes before we leave. God, what is wrong with my heart? I go over some facts I learned from uni, repeat them like a prayer. The human heart beats 100,000 times a day. 
Every day, it pushes 2,000 gallons of blood through 60,000 miles of blood vessels. A woman's heart is 20% lighter than a man's heart. A woman's heart is smaller than a man's heart. Um, Doctor Who has two hearts. <laughs> two larger than female hearts. I look at my cladding. I think of Daniel. Reese is the spit of his dad. A smaller heart doesn't love any less. Reese points at the door, he wants to get out, so I reach into the pushchair basket for something to distract him. I glance up and I see him accelerating towards us. He's on a motorbike, he's heading for the bus for the window by me and Reese, and my heart, it's screaming at me, it's telling me to, I take the, the brake off the push chair, I shove it down the bus and the bike hits, hits my seat, me cracking in pain, my ribs are breaking, I'm thrown to the right, I fall on my back, I turn my head to look at the push chair and a woman is taking Reese out, she looks at me, Darkness. My heart story is settling into darkness. Oh, I don't know where this darkness is. I try not to panic, but I need to become conscious. How do I do that? Reese, I need to be with Reese. He's not good with strangers. He won't settle. Sirens. I can hear sirens and Daniel's voice. He's, he's calling my name again and again. It's working, I'm coming back. And a machine. I can hear a machine. It sounds like the sea. Waves. Darkness. Back to darkness. No, no, this isn't right. I, I need to be with Reese. He's always with me. My heart wants to panic, but it can't. Something is controlling it. My heart doesn't beat like this. Love's not robotic. Reese! Sunlight. A hospital room. Oh, this feels different. I feel less grounded. I'm standing next to a hospital bed with two women. Doctors. There's a woman in the bed, unconscious. She looks like a washed up jellyfish. I want to go to her, but I can't move my feet. Why don't they comfort her? Hold her hand. But they ignore me. No. They can't hear me. Darkness. Oh, Reese. Reese. The way his skin looked brown and old when he was born, like, like a treasure map waiting to be uncurled. The same room. The woman again. More people. They're taking blood. Have you asked if you can do that? Have you asked if you can do that today? Darkness. The way he rubs ice cream on his face from the corn and says he's doing his makeup, his Bobby Brown. Oh, the way he'll only fall asleep if I hold him tightly next to me in his bed, like, like we're in a ship's cabin being tossed by the waves. 
a different room. Artificial light. The woman. The people are, are wearing masks. And a man stands over her. He's, he's middle-aged and portly. He takes out a knife, cuts through, and a saw, and I don't want to see this. He opens her chest. He's inside her chest. He's wriggling his hands around like she's his. He takes out her heart. He looks at it curiously, like a child looking at something scooped from a rock pool. He holds it out over a cool box and It slips away from him, powerless. The woman's left hand sticks out from under the blue sheet. She wears a cladder ring. Mahi cladder ring. I look at my heart. I, I look at it and I see, I see one of them snaps the cool box shut and runs out of the room like she's scared I'll wake up. I close my eyes. send myself back to darkness. I rest in it a while. I open them here. Because one day Reese will come here and I will tell him. My heart is inside somebody else now. But it still beats for you. When I looked in the cool box, my heart has the name Rhys stamped through it. Like a stick of rock. <laughs>